I didn't know his mom back then. I knew his dad. Yeah, his dad was cool. I mean, he was one of the neighborhood cats. He worked with my dad sometime, cut lines, and uh, you know, did with did with the guys um, in my neighborhood did back in the day. That I didn't know. Well, he was always uh, a Julius Irvin fan, and. That I think that's where it came from the uh, whole doctor thing. He was the bat as a basketball player, right? Right. Dr. Dre. Well, back then, world class wrecking crew. I'm, I'm sorry, Lonzo was making what we, what we call underground mixes, and uh, Dre. Uh, I had DJ Yellow working for me making my mixes, and uh, Dre went to work for my boy Unknown DJ to making his mixes and <laughs> oddly enough he didn't like the financial arrangement so he came over to my camp and uh, he started mi doing mixes for me and uh, shortly after that we stopped doing mixes we started we wanted to go, go legit with making record legitimate records met clientele and uh, we did a record called Slice that did okay locally but when Dre came, with the, we had the idea about doing the uh, my surgery. When Dre came along, by him having that the doctor theme, we had the idea of doing a song called Surgery, and that's one. That's the one that got us our, our initial recognition. Yes, it did quite well for an independent record with no no promotion, no money, just some guys in the studio trying to make something happen. That's the scope. Uh, he had um, various doctor outfits: purple ones, white ones, uh, sequence sequence ones. We uh, we 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 were showmen. Again, we were showmen because at that time, world class wrecking crew were the were the only rap groups on R and B shows, and we couldn't do the uh, modern day. T-shirt, tennis shoes, tattoo type situation to uh, be on stage. We had to compete with the Mary Jane Girls, Morris Day and the Time, Bar K's, Climax, these type of groups. So we had to kind of meet their dress code. We opened up, well, Ready for the World was our opening act on a few shows. Tony, Tony, Tony. Uh, we played with them. So this was the attire, the stage attire of that time. Hell no. It never, it never occurred to me. Uh, if you know Dre, if you knew Dre back then, Dre was the most fun-loving, silliest cat you ever wanted to meet. Dre was, was old focus. Dre had three things on his mind. Uh, music, money, and women. And if it wasn't involved in those three, it, it never, it, would, uh, it wasn't about, Dre had no interest in it. And he was always he was he was a clown and he was a, a big kidder. He was he always had like like having fun. We all did. That was the whole thing about World Class Wrecking Crew. We all enjoyed what we were doing, and it was fun for us. And we did it for the for the money, but mostly for the girls and the good times. You know, um, I tell people all the time we had this bad habit. We would we would be in traveling vans a lot and eating fast foods and we all have gas and we didn't have time to stop every time somebody had to cut one and uh we would call it sound check and we'd be in the studio we'd be in the van and it's like what they call that the uh the dutch chamber or something like that and it's just oh and dre he would he would hang with the best of them <laughs> Yeah, he was funky on mo more than one end. Let's put it that way, okay? <laughs> you know, he, he was he, he was cool to hang out with. He was, but only thing about Dre that always upset me. I liked having a riding buddy. I drew a lot. I did a lot of driving back then, going back and forth to Macola. Picking up records, selling records, and Dre was no company whatsoever. He'd get in the car, and by the time the door would close, he'd be dead asleep. Yeah, y'all sleep or fart one or two, okay? <laughs> you, you know, we, um, I can't say what went wrong. 
I can say that hip hop started to make a change in a different direction with groups like Run DMC, LL Cool J. Now, Run DMC had played Eve After Dark before we had even made our first record. And to see them go to the heights of what they had achieved at that time, and they weren't uh, wearing fancy suits, they weren't uh, rehearsing, they had on jeans and their leather coats. And um, Plus, Dre and Yella hated to rehearse. And I made them rehearse because that's how I was trained. I was, I was uh, a theater major. I believed in rehearsal and practiced the whole nine yards. And uh, they hated that because they took away from their girl time. And then they started seeing the other groups wearing tennis shoes and jeans. And again, I'm from a different era. I'm a, I'm a 70s kid. I, you know, I grew up in a different era. So I just couldn't picture myself going on stage wearing tennis shoes and doing it like that. And, and that's, that's what they wanted to do. And uh, so that was kind of the, um, the vision, the social division of the Wrecking Crew. And then the money dried up. We were signed to CBS Records. We had a, had a decent contract initially, and our album kept getting pushed back, pushed back. We couldn't get any gigs. We couldn't uh, get any royalties. And uh, so now folks is looking at me like, hey, man, I need some money. I need some, too. And uh, Easy was around with his money, and Dre had gotten into some trouble getting tickets or whatever the case may be, and I stopped getting him out of jail, and Easy came to play. And uh, I think maybe Dre may have felt that I, I betrayed him, but... I did the same tough love move my dad did to me when I went to jail. And he told me, I'm going to get you out a couple of times. After that, I'm going to let you figure it out for yourself because at some point in time, you got to be responsible. And that was the move I initiated with Dre. Hey, man, I did this twice already. We're not going to the studio. We're not going on the tour. So you need to either make some friends or find somebody else to get you out of jail because I'm not doing it this time. And that was kind of the... the um, that was one of the things that probably initiated the move and uh, caused some dissension in the uh, crew. You know, when you know people like I know people, and I'm like, yeah, right. You guys going to be gangsters, going to portray gangsters? Come on, man. You know, um, I'll never claim to be in a gangster, but when it comes to handling your street business, my reputation is much more validated than any of, those, any of the guys that are portrayed to be gangsters. And I was just surprised they went that way, but I also uh, was surprised people bought it. And, you know, like I said before, if you want to sell it and somebody wants to buy it, more power to you. It, it, well, it was a, they, were, they were characters, and I tell people all the time, just like in the movie, when my character says to them, Easy. I mean, I tell him my character is like Dre. Y'all, y'all. I forgot what the, what, the, what the exact line was, but I indicated to them that you guys uh, are, are not what you say you are. Easy is real. You guys aren't. And you know, I said that, and my guy said that in the movie. And when I tell people they're not gangsters today, it's hard for people not to believe that. But they never claimed to set in any of their records that I can recall. They never said I'm a gangster. Well, gangster, gangster. They spoke of the gangster lifestyle, but no individual ever claimed a set as being a gangster. And it's hard for people to accept the fact that they were characters. And they are characters. And they play a role. And the role is so close to reality, people can't separate the two. Yeah, and you know, and I I, I remember talking to Easy. Um, Easy and I kept stayed in contact uh, long after they after, after he got rich and you know Dre and Cube went on and do their thing. Easy would still come up my house from time to time, and uh, we would talk about that sometime. And he was he was always he thought it was funny. You know, he's like they you know he he didn't really he took himself serious as a character, but but if you knew Easy like I knew Easy, he would talk about it like wow, you know. He's doing all this right here, and he knows what he is and what he's not. But because he has his, his role to play, he played it very well. You know, uh, I would see Dre uh, occasionally in Hollywood or in various parts of town. And he and I would talk, man, for hours sometimes. I mean, we always had a good relationship. We never had an argument or a fight. He didn't like the fact that I didn't get him out of jail, but for the most part... Dre's pretty a, a non a non um, confrontational cat, and 
you know, it, we never had a problem. So when I saw him, he was always open arms. In fact, I saw him, uh, I hadn't seen him for quite some time before the shoot of the movie. And I went to the, mo the movie shoot, and I, he saw me, and I saw him. And, man, we were glad to see each other. We talked for about 45 minutes. He invited me over to Video Village to uh, screen the, the, um, the shooting of the scene between his character and my character. We sat there and kicked it. You know, it's, it's never been a real issue. It's just time and uh, time just got in our way, I guess. Yeah, I saw it even three times. I like it. I love it as a piece of it, as, as what it is, entertainment. Okay, but when you've been behind the scenes and look behind the curtain and you've seen the wizard and you've seen Toto and you know all the wheels and bells and whistles that go along with that, you, you I know where the inconsistencies and eh, the license, the creative license was utilized. Let's put it that way. I was there. Okay. Um. Well. It seems like they took a lot of the important stories of the career of NWA and laced them together with some um, other situations without the details. You know, when you when I uh, when my character uh, got on Dre for uh, letting Ice Cube perform, that never happened. Never happened in real life. I got on Dre for allowing his cousin Jinx to perform a song called My Penis at Dudos in front of the police when I got a crowd of 15 and 16 year olds. But to my knowledge, Ice Cube never, never set foot in Dudos. Yeah, I was. Um, yeah, yeah. All Everybody, with Dre, D. Barnes, and uh, a lot of the early, uh, a lot of the celebrities, now celebrities, would hang in my house on a daily basis. I mean, it was you come to the house and you see the who's who's of what the who's who of West Coast hip hop at my house, either writing in the studio in the backyard, hanging out. So, oh, I was very um, disappointed to hear what happened when it happened. I'd never seen that before. I'd never seen that. I'd, I'd never seen that part of that side of him before. I, when I was surprised, when I was surprised when I heard it happen. Like Dre, are you serious? And uh, you know, I was blown away because I'd, I'd never seen that side of him before. Yeah, and I, I understand Michelle has did several interviews uh, saying that she had had some um, uh, some problems with him as well. Um, he's achieved a lot. He's achieved his, he's a, he has achieved his goal of being the number one producer of hip hop in the country. When Dre was younger, he used to always idolize Herbie Lovebug. Herbie Lovebug was the producer of Salt and Pepper and several West Coast, I mean East Coast acts at that time, and he just thought that was the man to beat, and he achieved that. He also um, thought that uh, Teddy Roddy was the guy to go after. He achieved that. And I think he'd achieved more than he ever thought he could possibly do and because he surprised everybody, including himself. Yeah, I couldn't be more proud of him if it was my own son. Yeah, right there on the line of Segundo. Yeah, we want to Lonzo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm having a ball. Thank you very much.